Good morning. Welcome once again to another study in the book of the Psalms. My name is Pastor John Bolger, and I welcome you to our study. This morning we are going to look at Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Why don't we begin our time by asking the Lord to bless our, our study. And Lord, we are grateful to be together this morning. We are grateful to be able to study your word. We pray that its truths will infiltrate our hearts, change our thinking, and affect and change how we live our lives as well. Amen. All right, well, if you'll join with me, turn in your Bibles, if you have a Bible, if you have a Bible app on your iPhone, or if not, you can just listen along as I read the Word of God, Psalm 24. A Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. We are entitling this message, The Rule of the Sovereign King. The Rule of the Sovereign King. This is a common theme in the Psalms, that is, the King ruling the Lord as King ruling over all the earth. And yet I have to say that for many of us, the understanding of God as king, though we talk much about his kingship, uh, though we talk much about his sovereignty, I don't think many of us can understand it experientially. You know, living under a king in the 21st century who holds absolute power, and that is foreign to most of us as Americans and to many other people in the world. I did a little research on this, though, because there are countries in the world that still have kings. Many of them are figureheads like uh, Queen Elizabeth in the United Kingdom. But there are other countries, amazingly enough, where the monarch, the king, still holds absolute power. Those countries are Bahrain, Brunei, Qatar, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Swaziland, the United Arab Emirates, and the Vatican City. That would be the Pope, even though he's elected. Interestingly, all those countries, aside from the Vatican and Swaziland, are Islamic countries. Those countries still have monarchs who hold absolute power. This psalm that we just read highlights the sovereign ruler of the earth. We know, of course, that is the Lord God of hosts. But it also highlights his upright subjects and his triumphal entrance into his city. This psalm, as it were, is a picture of God's kingdom and all its glory. As we know, this is one of David's psalms, it tells us in the superscription. And we like to tr at least attempt to find what the historical context is. It doesn't give us any clear clues in the psalm. But we do have some inferences that make us believe that this psalm was written to commemorate the bringing in of the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. If you'll turn to 2 Samuel 6, we can look and see... Uh, possible historical background. 2 Samuel 6, David has recently become king, and one of the first things he did as king was to conquer Jerusalem, 
to make it his capital city. There wasn't a capital city per se before that in Israel. Jerusalem was ruled by Canaanite peoples, the Jebusites. David brings in the Ark of the Covenant, which had not been in the city, had not even been in the tabernacle up to this point. And so let me read these verses, beginning in verse 12 of 2 Samuel 6. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the Ark of God. It had been at that man's house before it was brought into Jerusalem. David went and brought up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And so it was that when the bearers of the Ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and the sound of the trumpet. Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David that Michal, the daughter of Saul, that would be David's wife, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in the place inside the tent where David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Further, he distributed to all the people, to all the multitude of Israel, both to men and women, a cake of bread and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. Now that recounting is a little bit sparse, but if you go to the parallel passage, which we won't this morning, but I encourage you to do so, if you go to 1 Chronicles 15, you have an extended dis description of this event. It was a grand uh, um, celebration. It was a triumphal procession into Jerusalem. Many people came out. It was like a, a major parade. And there was a celebration, apparently a feast of some kind, or at least gifts were given to people. And they celebrated the fact that the Ark of the Lord was brought into the city of Jerusalem. And remember, the Ark of the Lord, which was the most important piece of furniture in the tabernacle, was placed in the most holy section of the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies, a curtain-off area inside the tabernacle. And God's presence dwelt above the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim, the angels that were, uh, not real angels, but they were um, angels made of gold. Their wings touched, so it looks sort of like this. And God's presence dwelt above the cherubim, it frequently tells us that. So, uh, this was very symbolic. The ark being brought back into uh, the tabernacle, into the new capital city of Jerusalem, symbolized God's power, God's presence with the people of Israel. Whenever they looked at the tabernacle and later the temple, and they knew where the holy place and the holy of holies were, they could say, God is with us. Though God is omnipresent, there was a tangible way God can, can uh, determine his presence, maybe that's a good verb, to where it will be recognized. And so his presence dwelt in the ark of the Lord, and so that was very important. Needless to say, this was a huge event. So many scholars believe that this was the background for Psalm 24, and that will help us to understand. David was a songwriter, and we know that even today people will write songs to commem commemorate a, a major event. It's not a surprise that David would do this. Now it's interesting because this psalm seems to consist of three distinct hymns that were brought together, perhaps for this occasion. Also, and this is very important, and this is frequent in the Psalms, particularly in Psalm 24, it will become apparent that the Psalm goes beyond the events of David's day. The Psalm is prophetic, uh, eschatological, it looks to the end times, it is really messianic when it looks to the greater king. I'm not, not talking about David, not talking about Solomon, looking forward to the future sovereign king 
the Lord Jesus Christ when he will set up, his, set up his rule on this earth. And so as we look at this brief psalm of, of ten verses this morning, we're going to see three aspects of this glorious reign of the Messiah. It's not talking about David's reign. You could say his reign prefigures it to some extent. And Solomon's reign later on, even though Solomon is not mentioned, Solomon didn't even exist at this time. This psalm shows us three aspects of the glorious future reign of the Messiah, the sovereign king. First, we will look at the sovereign's realm, or the Messiah's realm. That would be the earth. Secondly, and that's in verses 1 and 2. Second, we'll look at the sovereign subjects, which are the righteous, found in verses 3 and 6. And finally, the sovereign's triumph, verses 7 through 10, which is the Messiah's victorious reign in Jerusalem. So let's look more closely at this marvelous psalm. First of all, the sovereign's reign, verses 1 and 2. It tells us, the earth is the Lord's in all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. This is a common language in the Old Testament. This was not new information. God was the ruler of the earth. He was sovereign. That's a particular word that could be applied to a king. The king had absolute control and absolute rule. Excuse me. They had absolute rule. They didn't always have absolute control. But God, the sovereign king, does. So this is almost, this is a, a, a very uh, common statement. Exodus 19.5 says this. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. God is sovereign over the earth. He can do with it as he pleases. That's the point of that passage. In Deuteronomy 10, 14. We find these words. Moses says, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Uh, what is nice, uh, what is exciting about our psalm this morning is that it is also quoted in the New Testament that gives us some interpretive information, or at least bolsters our esteem of it. And if you go to First Corinthians, uh, Corin can't say, I'm trying to say Chronicles. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 25 and 26. David is talking about eating meat sacrificed to idols. He says, verse 25, Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord and all it contains. God created the earth for the benefit of mankind. We won't go into the, the, the context of that, but that's David's point. It says, For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Verse 2, this is creation language. Genesis 1, 9 and 10. The waters separated from the waters. Psalm 136, 5 and 6. I will read this. You can look up Genesis 1, 9 and 10 on your own. But in Genesis, ooh, excuse me. Psalm 136, 5 and 6. To him who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Poetic language. God created the land and the seas. You can also go to Proverbs 8.29, Isaiah 45.18 to see the same language. Now, what I want to point out to you, which I think is very crucial is that the psalmist, David, is emphasizing the fact that the Lord is the owner of the earth. And he uses a parallel term, the world, and those who dwell in it. Interestingly, he could have also included the heavens or the sky, but he doesn't. And I think there's a point being made here, and that is, he's emphasizing, as we will see, 
the Lord's sovereign rule over the earth, the physical earth. We're not looking at the universe. We're not looking at the heavens and earth, although he was certainly sovereign over those as well. And you understand that. Because he's making a point of the sovereign, the ruler, ruling on the physical earth. It's not just a general rule over all creation, but a specific rule on the physical earth. Now, moving along, we saw the sovereign's realm. If he owns the earth, as it tells us, can do as he will with it. Verses 3 to 6 give us the sovereign subject. If there's a kingdom, we know there's a king, there will be subjects in that kingdom. Verse 3. He says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? Now, this is interesting. This language brings us to Psalm 15, which talks about those who can go before the Lord's presence. And, of course, we know that we'll be talking about the righteous. But here it says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? This is a reference to Jerusalem, and particularly a section of Jerusalem where the later temple would be built called Mount Zion, a hill, as it were, a part of Jerusalem. Who may be in this part of Jerusalem? That is, who may go before the Lord in the tabernacle? And we might even say David has in mind the future permanent tabernacle, the temple. Who may go before the Lord? And remember, they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant, which has God's presence with it. Who may even approach these things? He says, he, verse 4, he gives us four elements. He says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and has not sworn deceitfully. Now, this is not a, uh, uh, an exhausted list. It's not talking to somebody, but somebody that's washed their hands etc. It's talking about somebody that is in a right standing before God, and it's just a summary statement. There could be many other things they could describe. Someone that uh, doesn't lie, it tells us. He's not lifted up his soul to falsehood. He has a pure heart, innocent, guileless. This is not talking about somebody that's sinless, but in the human realm, Someone is in a right relationship with their Lord. They must be prepared, as it were, to enter in the presence of the Lord. In the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The Beatitudes are describing people that are worthy to be in His kingdom, the righteous, the elect believers. And they are called pure in heart. We have this idea also in Job 17.9. Nevertheless, the righteous will hold to his way, and he who has clean hands will grow stronger and stronger. The righteous are equated with those with a, who have clean hands. In other words, there's no uh, uh, clean hands. They have not been, uh, they've not done anything wicked where their hands would be dirty or covered with blood. They are innocent of any wrongdoing, as it were. And then Psalm 51, verse 10. This is David's penitential psalm. What he says in verse 10, as he's praying to the Lord, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Again, supporting the idea of being in a right relationship with the Lord. Those who are in God's kingdom must be prepared to be in that kingdom. That's a simple fact. Remember, the Jews were confused about this whole notion of kingdom. They recognized that there would be a kingdom on earth when the Messiah would rule, although they had the details muddied. But they thought entrance, uh, the requirement for entrance into that kingdom was their ethnic pedigree. They were Jewish. That's all that matters. Ah, sure, they should be uh, try to live righteous lives, but what was most important is that they were Jews. They were God's people. They were descendants of Abraham. But sadly, they were mistaken. The primary entrance requirement to be in God's kingdom was that they were righteous. 
godly, in a right relationship with their God. They were descendants of Abraham, but spiritual descendants of Abraham, who was justified by faith. One writer says, these sample qualities do not signify sinless perfection, but rather basic integrity of inward motive and outward manner. So the subjects of the sovereign, of the king, in his kingdom, must be in a right relationship with him. Not everybody will be allowed into the kingdom. Verses 5 and 6, He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteous, righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Language is a little bit complicated in the Hebrew and a little bit in the English. But those who seek him, those who follow after the Lord are the ones who will be in that kingdom. This was presented initially to Israel, to Jacob, but it was ultimately to all peoples, all that would trust him, believe in him. So we've seen the sovereign's realm, which is the earth. Secondly, we've seen the sovereign subjects, which are the righteous, those who are in a right relationship with him. They must be prepared. Thirdly, we see the sovereign's triumph, verses 7 through 10. And you, When you read the psalm, you say, wow, it really changes gears here. The first uh, six verses seem to be somewhat related, but the next four verses seem to take in another direction, but really... No, uh, they may have originally been written separately and then brought together. We don't know that for sure. But even if they were, David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, brought them together to glorify the Lord. And again, since it's very likely this was written to commemorate the entrance of the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, this section particularly is most uh, most uh, significant, most appropriate. In other words, verses 7 through 10 uh, show us... Uh, uh, well, let me back up again. Let me back up a second. The Ark of the Covenant coming into Jerusalem signifying the Lord entering the capital city. It signified the king. And it was wonderful that David came into Jerusalem. He was the king of Israel. But David recognized that the true king, the sovereign king of Israel, not just Israel, Israel, the whole earth, was God, the Lord of hosts, whose presence was known with the Ark of the Covenant. So, the sovereign's triumph, verses 7 through 10, that is, the Messiah, the sovereign king's victorious reign in Jerusalem, we're not just looking at the historical event that took place during David's um, Reign that was about a thousand BC when he was king. And we're not just talking about when the Ark of the Covenant came in Jerusalem, but we're looking farther, we're looking broader. When the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, will enter Jerusalem and set up his kingdom on this earth. It says, verse 7 and 8, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Simple, poetic language that's repetitive, as you'll see. Personifying, using anthropomorphisms, as if the gates, the doors of the 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 city of Jerusalem could lift up their heads like a person would. Some say well, maybe they had a they had a, a drawbridge where the door actually went up and down, like you look see in medieval kingdoms. Not necessary. The doors could have been like a regular door hinge, a double door. But the point is, is that they are recognizing and opening, as it were, submitting to the entrance of the ruler, the king. And who is that king? The Lord, Yahweh, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. The emphasis there, when it says mighty in battle, is a king returning to a city after a victorious campaign, after a victory over their enemies. 
in our own country, in the United States, in World War II and other, I'm sure, other wars. But when the troops came back from World War II and it was ended, there was a big celebration, at least in New York City, with confetti and ticker tapes. People celebrated. They rejoiced at the ending of that war. And the Americans, along with the other allies, were victorious. And so it was a victorious celebration. So some other, some other verses that emphasize this language. Psalm 29, verse 2. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in holy array. And then in Exodus 15... Exodus 15, verses 3 and 6, and this is the song of Moses after the Israelites had crossed through the Red Sea and God had given them uh, deliverance and also destroyed the Egyptian army. Moses wrote a commemorative song, and in verse 3 of Exodus 5, it says, The Lord, excuse me, Exodus 15, 3 5, the Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. Verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. That Moses recognized that it was the Lord that gave the Israelites deliverance. The Israelites didn't open the Red Sea and they didn't destroy the Egyptian army. The Lord did. Of course, this is anthropomorphism because the Lord uh, didn't lift it, it didn't have a hand or an arm to physically defeat the Egyptians, they were destroyed with a word. Uh, one other passage, Deuteronomy 4, verse 34. Moses describing the uniqueness of God, or has a God tried to go to take for himself a nation from within another nation by trials, by signs and wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? This little warrior motif of the Lord is common in Scripture. He was the mighty warrior who went before the Israelites in battle to destroy their enemies. By the way, you might notice that it just mentioned gates and doors of a city. But what's the city? Well, the implication, of course, because of the historical context, is it's Zion. It's Jerusalem. Now, again, if the Ark of the Covenant is being brought into Jerusalem, this would have had great symbolic import. Though David had conquered uh, Jerusalem, he'd conquered it, taken it from the Jebusites, and David had already been in several military campaigns. It seems to go beyond the fact that the Ark of the Lord coming in was sort of a, a, a victory march. It goes farther when, uh, as I said, the sovereign king of the universe, the Messiah, will enter Jerusalem having defeated his enemies. Well, let's continue to read. You're probably thinking, where do you get that from this? Stay with me. Verses 9 and 10. Let's see how repetitive it is. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. You'll see that there's language. Excuse me. The language is just repetitive. And again, David's not celebrating his victory. And as far as we know, though there had been military campaigns in David's life before this, the immediate time frame was not they had just conquered a people and they were coming in Jerusalem. Remember, they were celebrating the Lord's presence with the Ark of the Covenant coming into Jerusalem. So we have a broader scope here. This King of Glory, the phrase is a little bit different when it says, Who is this King of Glory? It says, The Lord of Hosts, Yahweh of Sabaoth. He is the King of Glory. This word host, Sabaoth, um, can mean, uh, it can be referred to angels. 
Oftentimes it makes reference to that, but also literally means armies. So again, that military, the mighty warrior motif, the king of the universe, the sovereign lord of hosts of armies, the divine commander-in-chief has entered his capital city with victorious, with victory. So David looks farther than just his own reign when God gave him victory. Or even the other kings of Israel and Judah when God would give them miraculous victories over their enemies. But this looks to the future when God incarnate, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come physically on this earth to, to reign in Jerusalem, a physical city, and he will have subjects just like a king does, and he will come victoriously defeating his enemies. We make this point because some people say, well, yes, we know that Jesus is Lord and God is King and He's the ruler of the world in a spiritual sense, even now, sure, I agree with you. However, Scripture many, many, many times tells us that there will be a time when Jesus will come and rule. The Messiah will come. Old and New Testament passages will come to rule physically on this earth. It's not a spiritual realm. It's a physical realm. Queen Elizabeth, even though it's a figurehead, but understand the analogy, Queen Elizabeth reigns in England, Buckingham Palace. She has a throne that she uses sometimes. But on a much greater scale, we have the rule of the sovereign king. All right, well, let's just, as we bring this to a close, this has been a quick psalm with majestic import. Revelation 19 describes the coming of the Lord Jesus after the tribulation. And tell me if you don't hear language that we find in our little psalm today. This will help draw it together. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. And I saw heavens open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name ex written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed with fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will ride them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We know, of course, that this is describing the Lord Jesus Christ coming to earth as a victorious king, conquering, destroying his enemies. And you say, well, wait a second, okay? Wait, well, we can figure that out, but it doesn't say anything about Jerusalem or Morbell's realm. It's just him coming, conquering, all right? Well, we see that, how it connects to verses 7 through 10, the, the mighty king, victorious. Let's look at another passage that helps fill fill in the spaces here. Turn over to Zechariah chapter 14. The second to the last Old Testament prophet, Zechariah 14, and that's the last chapter of Zechariah. This is describing the same event. Zechariah 14 verse 1. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations, did you note that? All the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Initially, the nations will have the upper hand. Then the Lord... Yahweh would go forth and fight against those nations, and when he fights, 
as when he fights on a day of battle, and that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north, and the other half toward the south. The king, the Messiah, the Lord, it says, notice what it says, not a man, a human man, it's the God-man, the Lord will come physically to Jerusalem to a specific place, the Mount of Olives. There will be a cataclysmic earthquake that will split the mountain. Verse 5, it says, You will flee in the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Notice the language from Revelation 19. And that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle, for there will be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that day living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, and the other half toward the western sea. It will be summer as well as winter. Listen to verse 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day the Lord will be the only one and his name the only one. Notice the language. King over all the earth. It doesn't say heaven and earth, although he is sovereign, the root sovereign universal ruler over all the universe. It says specifically he will be king over all the earth. My friends, what could that be referring to then? The ruler, the Messiah. A couple more verses. All the land, verse 10, all the land will be changed into a plain from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the Lord's king's wine presses. Excuse me. People will live in it. There will no longer be a curse for Jerusalem will dwell in security. There will be physical geographic changes during that reign. But notice the summary. The people will dwell in security because the Lord will be with them. Uh, interesting parallel in Psalm 24, the historical context. The ark of the Lord being in the city of Jerusalem would have certainly brought much comfort and peace to the Israelites. God is with us, as it were, they could say when they started to be fearful of some enemy or some event. They could look over at the tabernacle and later the temple and say, The Lord is with us, dwelling in the Holy of Holies, in the Ark of the Covenant. How much greater will that comfort be? How much greater will that peace be when the Lord Jesus Christ sets up His rule in Jerusalem? Physically, He will be there. And His people will be able to rejoice and say, God is with us. Friends, this psalm has been historical, eschatological, and messianic. We still look forward to this day when the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, will come to set up His rule on this earth. This psalm anticipates it. This psalm prophesies it. We know who the king is, the Messiah. We know what his realm is, the earth. We know that he will enter and come victoriously, a victor over his enemies, into Jerusalem, an actual city that exists to this day. But I want to emphasize one other thing. What's the important thing for us? It's those who are his subjects. Are you one of his subjects? Are you a part of his kingdom? Are you in a right relationship with him? My friend, if you have turned from your sin and placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, if you have recognized his sovereign rulership, you will be a part of that kingdom. You are the subjects that are described here in verses 3 through 6. And when he returns, he will bring all of his subjects to be with him. My friend, if you are not in a right relationship with him, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you are not one of his subjects. In fact, you are one of his enemies. You are the people that will be destroyed. 
you live during the tribulation, if that comes in our lifetime, you will be some of those enemies that will be destroyed. But if not, wherever you are, ultimately, if you have not placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be turned away. You will not be a part of that kingdom and you will spend eternally, eternity separated from Him. Friend, I implore you to read these verses, to study them, and if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, to cry out to Him in mercy as the tax gatherer did in Luke 17 and say, Oh Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. I recognize that I'm a sinner. I have spurned your love and your righteousness. My sins have put you on the cross. You died for my sins. I recognize that your death paid the penalty for my sins. I pray that you would be merciful and give me salvation and turn me from my wicked ways that I might be in a right relationship with you, that Christ's righteousness might cover me, that I might be one of those subjects that's described here in Psalm 24. Lord, let's pray, friends. Lord, this has been a great psalm, a reminder of the grand scope of the psalms. They're not just psalms of praise and encouragement and thanksgiving to read when you're going through trials. You want to be encouraged. But they also have eschatological and messianic import. They look to the future. They're the grand scheme of things when our Lord Jesus Christ will come and set up his rule on this earth. Father, we long for that time. In the meantime, let us be prepared. Let us look forward to the coming of our Messiah, the Sovereign King. Lord, we thank you for this reminder in this grand little psalm. We pray that it would touch the hearts of all those who have listened to this message. And it's in your sons, the matchless Messiah, the glorious King. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Friends, I thank you so much for listening to this to this uh, message in Psalm 24. If you have benefited from this ministry, I encourage you to tell others to listen to this message on YouTube. There are others that we have taken from the Psalms, and I pray that you will be blessed and that God is glorified. Thank you again. Have a good day.